Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jennifer Simon. I'm Director of Programs and Outreach at Surf Plus, the Artist Safety Net. We help artists prepare for, respond to, and recover from emergencies. And this webinar is also sponsored by Orange Genius, um, an incredible platform for artists to sell their work, share their portfolio, and um, uh, get expertise and all that great stuff. We've partnered together to offer a series of webinars. Um, Steve Schlackman has presented on a number of topics and he will be presenting today on copyright basics for creatives. This webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to replay it for free um, soon after this webinar has concluded. If you have any questions, just uh, put them in the Zoom webinar chat and periodically we'll look over and to the best of our ability, answer them. And any questions not answered, I'm sure Steve will be able to answer um, offline. So with that, I'll take it uh, to Steve. Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll also uh, try to give you a PDF of this presentation so you'll have it after the presentation. Uh, and my goal today is to teach you about copyright and to try to make it uh, copyright fun and exciting, which is not always easy to do with loft legal type things, but we're going to give it our best shot. So first, uh, just a little about me and why, you know, I, I should be giving you information and maybe you should pay attention. Um, I am the product innovation director at Orange Genius. So, uh, uh, and like, uh, we, we basically are, uh, think of us as sort of a LinkedIn slash IMDB for the visual arts world. You should come check us out. You can set up resumes and portfolios and all sorts of good stuff. Um, I'm also a fine arts photographer uh, with the Manuel Fremen Gallery, and this is one of my images here at the top. So uh, I'm also a registered patent attorney and copyright attorney, but before I, I did that, I was in advertising and I was a photographer. So uh, I saw all the copyright issues from that side before I ended up in later in life becoming a, an attorney and learning how to deal with it all. So I have a pretty good perspective on, on how difficult it is, uh, how difficult copyright is to understand. And it really is a difficult concept. So I'm going to try to break it down and make it a little bit easier for you to understand and, and take away something practical that you can use every day. Uh, so let's just get into it. So uh, first, let's just talk about what copyright is, right? Copyright uh, is different than a lot of other laws because it is based in the Constitution itself. It's Article One, Section Eight. And you can see it here. Congress has the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. Um, and what the founders were trying to do is uh, encourage creative expression by giving people the control over their work. So back then, in in, in 1789, uh, copyright was only for books and maps. Uh, but think about somebody back then or even today. It spends you know a year or two on a book, and then. Uh, Maybe they get paid by a publisher in advance and, you know, they're working and living and, and then the book comes out and someone immediately steals it and they get no profit from it. And so who's going who's to, you know, do that? So in order to make that work, uh, they built this into the Constitution, right? Um, and just keep in mind as we, as we go through this process that uh, there's a constant battle between accessing information that we want the public to have and the protections and legal control over the people that create that. So there's sort of a push and pull uh, between those things and, and the courts have been battling that and it's, it's not settled in a, lot of, in a lot of areas, but we'll go into that, that. And if you understand that process, it'll help you better understand what's copyrightable and, and what's fair use, which we'll talk about quite a bit later. Hey, hey Steve, sorry, mm -hmm. this is Jennifer. Um, yep. Can you increase your volume a little on your output? A couple people can't hear. Uh, let's try this. Is that a little better? Can you hear me, hear me now? All right, well, hopefully that worked. Um, let's go on here. <clears throat> oh, I'll speak louder as well. Okay, so, it's better. Okay, great. So let's talk about like what, what we can copyright. So copyright is for uh, literary works, musical works, dramatic works, you know, plays and uh, pictures, movies, sound, architecture. These are all things that can be copyrightable. But in order to be eligible for copyright, 
they must have these three things that are listed here on the bottom. And the first is it must be something that's original. And it, it has to be work that you independently created. Uh, it isn't a derivative of some other work or it isn't, you know, something that even in the back of your mind, you might have seen somewhere and then created. Um, it, it, it needs to be a full product of your imagination. And it needs what they call fixed in a tangible medium. And all that means is it's got to be in a, in a way that someone else can look at it and, and, and uh, grab it over and over, right? So let's say uh, a, a camera, a film in a camera, the CCD in a camera, a, a piece of paper, a napkin, all of that is fixed mediums that you can uh, put your work onto. But let's say uh, you do something spontaneous or, or it's a dance move. Well, the dance move is not something that's fixed in a tangible medium. So the dancing wouldn't be copyrightable, that whole choreography. But writing the choreography down, the paper that it goes on would be copyrightable. And so would, let's say, uh, the movie or the, the film you're taking of the choreography, but not the choreography itself. So, uh, so you, you could copy the dance, but you couldn't copy the film of the dance. Um, and last, it has to have some minimal amount of creativity. Now, this is very much copyright law. Everything is gray areas. Not, there's, there are very few bright lines where you can say, well, what is minimal creativity? It really depends always, and that's what makes copyright really hard. Um, uh, so for an, just as an example, I had a, a friend I was doing copyright for. They, uh, he was doing a bunch of little cartoons where he used the man and uh, woman symbols, little round things with the arrows. And, the, and then there was some text with it and the copyright office wouldn't copyright it because those uh, items were things that everyone uses and had done before. And they didn't rise to the level of creativity uh, the way he was doing it required for copyright. So, um, you know, perhaps if there were uh, scenes and mountains and other things in the background of what he was doing, it would have been copyrightable, but just as symbols, it wasn't. Um, and what cannot be copyrighted. So this, this is important when you, you'll see when we talk about the rights, you're gonna have control over your work. So um, there are things that just can't be copyrighted like facts, right? It, it, it doesn't rise to the level of originality. You know, if you have a weather forecast or sports stats, if those were copyrightable, then no one else could use them. And then that would sort of defeat the purpose, right? So uh, facts are not copyrightable. An important one, ideas are not copyrightable, right? It's the expression of the idea. It's putting the idea to paper. So uh, anyone can write a book about uh, a boy wizard that goes to a school of wizardry and lives with a family that uh, isn't wizards that don't like him. Um, that's just a, a concept, that's an idea. But when you start getting into the way the characters are developed or a storyline or a lightning bolt on the kid's head or something like that. Now, now uh, you're, you're copying or making a derivative of uh, something that was an expression of the idea. So when someone says, you know, you've stolen my idea, and this is true of patents as well, the, uh, the idea isn't copyrightable. You know, it's, it's, it's the thing that you did with that idea that becomes copyrightable. Uh, also, short phrases, titles, names, slogans, those kind of things, they are not copyrightable. They are too short to rise to the level of uh, creativity. It also includes lists, uh, recipes and ingredients, things like that. Um, but some of this stuff is like uh, short phrases or titles can be uh, controlled by trademark instead. So there's a mechanism for those, but it's, it's not copyrighted. And what you see here on the right is the poster from Midnight in Paris, the Woody Allen movie with Owen Wilson. And in that movie, just as an example, Owen Wilson uh, utters a phrase. Uh, he was talking to somebody, he says, the past is never dead. It's not even past. And, you know, I know that's true because I met Faulkner, you know. And the Faulkner's, this was, this quote came from one of Faulkner's books, Requiem for a Nun. It was one of his most famous quotes. And it was used without permission. The Faulkner estate sued Woody Allen uh, and, the, and the film company. And the court said, you know, as profound as it is, it's not 
It doesn't rise to the level of creativity required. Perhaps if the whole paragraph was used or, you know, page from the book, but the quote wasn't enough. So the case was dismissed. So, um, so keep that in mind. So now let's talk about what, what your rights are. You know, what do you get? Um, you have control. Well, first of all, copyrights are automatic now. It used to be that you had to put the little uh, copyright symbol with, you know, copyright 2001, Steve Schlackman or whatever on, on an image for it to be, or on a, any kind of work for it to be copyrightable. But now, as soon as you put your pen to paper and it reaches the level uh, of creativity required and originality, then it's automatically copyrighted. Um, you don't have to register the work. And what you get is the ability to control the work. First, you are the only one who's allowed to make a copy of the work. You're the only one who's allowed to distribute that work out to the world or publicly display the work, you know, on TV or in the gallery or uh, you, you're, uh, you could, are the only one who could uh, say who can publicly perform the work. That's mostly has to do with music and bands, you know, so a band can't cover your tune and, and, uh, and play it without your permission. And, uh, and you're the only one who can allow someone to make a derivative of your work. And derivative of a work is also one of those gray areas, what is considered a derivative. Um, but it's, it's seen from the view of a reasonable person observing. And if the reasonable person says that work obviously came from that other work, then that's considered a derivative. And you can imagine how in court, trying to prove that and, and having experts go back and forth and different people who have different reasonableness um, fight each other over these things. So uh, it's not easy to determine, but these are the things that you have control over. And they're your rights. And so you can do with, with them what you want. You can give them to people. You can sell them to people. Um, if you want to sell a part of one, you can do that if you want to give away a part of one think about it from the point and 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 for any duration as well so think about it let's say you know i'm a photographer and i uh show my stuff at the gallery so the what i'm doing is i'm i have a contract with them and i'm giving the gallery uh the right to publicly display my work and then i'm giving them the right to make limited copies they can't make copies and sell them as copies, but they want to make brochures and they want to make signs that stuck around New York City to show that the uh, show is going on and they can do those kind of things and they can, uh, um, and then at the end of a year, their rights are over and they don't have the right to those things anymore unless we re-up the contract. Um, but they may still have some other rights like uh, being able to keep it on their website to show that I was once worked working with them as, as, as an artist. Um, so it's whatever you want to do. It's, it's up to you to decide what you want to give away. Now, who is the copyright holder? Who owns the copyright? Well, that's dependent upon whether you're an employer or you're the, uh, whether you're a creator or you're a creator working for someone. So if you created the work or multiple people created the work, you are the copyright holder or holders. But if you're an employee, let's say you're a graphic designer for an advertising agency, then your work, if the work is created for the purpose, for, for the company, then that work is, uh, the copyright of that work is for the company. If you create your own work separately, that's still yours. But if you create work as an employee for the company, then the company is the one who holds the copyright. Um, if you're a freelancer, you generally hold the copyright. So let's say I create a logo for somebody. They are really being given a license to use that logo for the purpose, uh, for what you, you, what you made the logo for. But they can't necessarily take that logo and, uh, and sell it or sell it to somebody else to use in a movie. It's, it's, not, it's not theirs to sell. You only gave them a license to use it. And so, uh, think about it from, think about a, a, a real estate photographer. Real estate photographer goes in and takes pictures for a uh, real estate agent. And 
they retain the copyright and the real estate agent is buying this license. Now, two years down the road, the house goes up for sale again and the real estate agent gets that house again as their listing. And so they use the pictures again, but they really can't because the pictures were, were provided for that one time use. And if they want to use the pictures again, they have to pay another license. Now, this will change if it's, if it's what's considered a work made for hire. So if you see, if you ever do freelance work and you get a contract and it says, and it uses the language work made for hire, that basically means that you're not just transferring, you're not giving them a license, but you're transferring your copyright as well. And there's nothing wrong with that. Just know that it exists and that if you're going to transfer copyright, you may want to charge more uh, for it, or maybe you don't want to transfer the copyright. And so don't sign that agreement. Um, and just on the idea of agreements, a lot of people do handshakes and things. When we, when, as you'll see as we go through, and as you can see, even with the idea of derivatives, that since there are no bright lines, it does help to create a contract for, between you and whether it's fine artists selling a work or, uh, or a graphic designer doing a freelancer or, or whatever it is, the contract or at least even an email or something that sort of delineates what you would are allowing them to use it for. Otherwise it becomes he said, she said, and, uh, and there's no way to prove it and it becomes much more difficult to create and control, um, control your work. So it's always good to sort of lay it out so everybody knows. Sell a painting to someone, they don't always realize that they can't use that painting for other things, but they can't. They're only allowed to hang it in their home. They're, they can't you know, put it on t-shirts. That's your right as the, as the creator. Um, so let's just talk about uh, copyright infringement. So that's what this is all about, right? You're protecting your work and the government through the Copyright Act has created these rules and a means of enforcing your rights. And if someone uh, does any of those things, makes a copy, makes a derivative, then that's an infringement. And <coughs> There, and you and you have the right to stop them and and get some things from people that do that. Um, so, to inf to enforce your rights, the, you only have to show two basically two things: one, that you are the copyright holder. One way to do that is by registering the copyright with the U.S. Copyright Office. That's a good idea for a bunch of other reasons, which I'll tell you in a minute. Um, it becomes evidence that you are the owner of that. And even if someone copyrighted something that they weren't allowed to, uh, that's still the copyright notice is still uh, uh, the copyright uh, registration is still controlling and it becomes the burden of the other person to prove that they were actually the creator. So, <coughs> and other things like if you're a photographer, uh, you take a picture of something, you're obviously going to have tons of other pictures of that particular thing. Let's say you're doing a photo shoot. Um, so that's obviously proof that you're the creator. So um, if you're a painter, you may want to make sure that you're taking pictures of your process just to make sure that you always have something that shows that, hey, I'm actually the creator. And the second thing is just that it was used without your permission. And uh, if you didn't give permission, it's up to the other side to prove that somehow you did. Um, and that's it. So it's, you know, you do those two things and it's an infringement. And what's, what's really important is that copyright is a no-fault law. That it's called strict liability. It doesn't matter why you did something. If you did it, you're guilty. So let's say I buy a photo from a stock photo house, you know, like Getty Images. Uh, I pay my $400 for the image, and I'm using it on my product packaging. And it turns out that the person who gave it to Getty didn't have the right to give it to Getty. Well, you're still guilty because it's, there's no fault. You made the copy. Uh, and so you're guilty. Now in a situation like that, they might sue you, the, the copyright holder, and then you would sue Getty. Um, but it's a no fault law. So when you, when you see someone using your work, you, you don't have to necessarily prove that they're copyright uh, infringers. It's, evidenced by the fact that they are showing your work. But uh, so what ends up happening is usually it's not about 
the fact they did it. It's about what is it worth? How much can you sue them for over that? <coughs> Excuse me. So, so let's talk about that. It's, 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 da it's called damages. And there are really two types. The normal everyday type, which, is, uh, which a lot of law has, is uh, what they call actual and compensatory. Now, if someone uses your work without permission, the courts are not trying to punish them necessarily. They're not trying to give you a windfall, but they want to make sure that they don't uh, gain anything from the fact that they're using a work. And it doesn't matter. They may not even have realized that they were infringing, but they shouldn't profit from your work if you didn't give them permission. So what, what do you get in an infringement case? You get all of the profits from your work. That means that it's not the retail value of someone, uh, if uh, Macy's uh, sells a bunch of t-shirts that has your images on it and they did not have permission, then they can, t they look at all their sales, they could back out the, uh, the costs like shipping and some marketing and things like that. And then whatever's left over, they owe you as well as the, your losses, which would be the licensing fee that, uh, that you would have charged them. And of course you have to prove, you know, that this is a standard licensing fee and this is what you would have charged. And then there's always in the real world, there's always a lot of back and forth as to what, uh, what's considered a cost, you know? Um, and then, you, you know, you go back and forth and these things tend to settle. But the, the point here is that it actually, because of the, because legal fees are, are high, it becomes difficult to sue people or get your just reward because the reward is too small. So let's say someone puts an image on, uh, on a blog and they don't make any money from that. So therefore there's no actual damages. There's only your licensing fee that you lost. And let's say the licensing fee is only a few hundred dollars. A lawyer is $350 an hour. So you're not going to be able to get a lawyer to go sue somebody for, to, you know, for $400. It's, it's not going to happen. So it's very hard to, to, uh, to enforce in those situations. And even in something like the Macy's situation that we just talked about, at the time that you find out this is happening, you don't know how many they made. You don't know how many they sold. You don't know how, how, what the profit is on them. Uh, so it's, it's hard to judge. So in order to do that, you have to sue them and start discovery process to figure that out. And in the whole, in the meantime, you're paying a lawyer to do all this. And what if it turns out that they just put the, the, the shirts out there and they took them off the market and they only sold, you know, a hundred and make, uh, you know, at, at, at a dollar profit a piece and they made a hundred dollars or $10 and they made a thousand dollars and you just spent, you know, $2,000 or 2,500 on a lawyer to, to get there. And that's sort of the conundrum that a lot of people have and why, uh, and why there's a, a lot of infringement either purposely or not, or why there's misconceptions about infringement where people you can go up to a lot of people, they'll say, um, I, if I don't make money from it, then I'm not infringing. And that's wrong, but it sort of comes from this idea that people don't get sued if they don't make money on it because it's too much, uh, too expensive to sue. So the way that the court actually gets around this is through uh, statutory damages. And the way to get that is anybody who registers a work prior to an infringement or if they register the work within three months of what they call publication for publication, just think of it as making it available to the public. Could be an email, could be putting it on your website, could be putting it on Orange Genius, that's publication. Let's say you, you put your work up on Orange Genius, you just created it, you put it on Orange Genius and that day someone stole it. And you didn't even have time to register your work, so you can't register before because you didn't really have time to do that. So uh, the, the, the Copyright Act gives you a break. It says uh, you have three months from the time you publish it that people know about it. So even if someone takes it before that three months, you're still good. Otherwise, you need to register prior to the infringement. And if you do, you get a few, you get a few things. Uh, first, anywhere from 750 guaranteed. Remember, this is a no-fault law, so you get $750 to $30,000 for each infringement, depending upon you know, what the court decides uh, that's worth. And usually it's more than, than you would get in an actual damages situation. And um, 
you also get legal fees paid for almost always. It's, it's within the judge's discretion, but legal fees um, are almost always paid for something reasonable. So think about that. You could go to a lawyer and the lawyer will most likely take a case on what they call on contingency, which means that you may have to pay some certain out of pocket costs, like a filing fee for a few hundred dollars, but they won't charge you any legal fees until the judgment at the end. And then they take their money out of the money that you win at the end. So you don't have to lay out any money. And they do that because they know that it's a no fault law. They know these people are guilty and they know that that other side has to pay for the legal fees. Um, they also know that, uh, that in negotiations where uh, the other side might play games, try to make things more expensive for you, especially if they're a big company, the co that company like a Macy's knows that they're paying double legal fees every time they do that because you're not going to be responsible. So it's, it's good if, if, if you can register your work, it's, you can do that at the copyright office with uh, their echo system, ECO uh, it's $35 uh, for uh, registration and for photography, there's an exception where you can do up to 750 photos all taken in the same year by the same photographer uh, for $55. Uh, that's pretty much because of all the, you know, the amount of images people take when they're shooting digital now. Um, so it's always a good idea to do that and you get these statutory damages. Plus, you can also get willful infringement. So if somebody, if you tell somebody stop infringing on my stuff and they don't stop well now if they keep infringing they did that on purpose it's willful infringement it's, sometimes it's hard to prove but in that kind of situation it's not and uh, you can get up to hundred and fifty thousand dollars and there was a case here in Florida where um, these uh, this couple were creating uh, websites and using all all uh, stolen images and two of them happened to be registered and they just kept doing it enough so that their lawyer quit. And eventually, you know, they got a judgment of $300,000 against them, the top 150,000 for each uh, photo that they used. So um, keep that in mind. So here on the, on the side, you'll just see this sort of how, uh, flow chart of how the damages might work. Um, you discover an infringement, you ask yourself, was the work registered and, and just sort of follow up along to decide whether you can do statutory or actual damages. So let's talk about exceptions. This is where sort of fair use comes into play. This is what I was saying about this push and pull between wanting to make sure that everyone has information and be able to do certain things and not have to worry about uh, uh, the, the idea of, of artist speech and, and, and copyright. Um, so the first is the first is, and these are built into the Copyright Act. The first is criticism and commentary. So you're critiquing something like doing a book review or uh, or a movie review on TV. It's kind of hard to do without showing part of the book or, or, or a clip from the movie. So we want people to be able to critique things. And so uh, you can use a portion of a movie without permission. Now you can't, you know, use the whole movie. It's got to be reasonable, but you're allowed to do that. And because otherwise you would have to ask for permission. And let's say a movie comes out and it gets terrible reviews. The, the studio is not going to give everyone permission to use clips to give them terrible reviews. So it, it, it makes sense that this would be an exception. Same hey, thing. Yep. Hi, this is Jennifer. Just a quick question. Sure. Um, should I, as a Canadian artist, register with the U.S. Copyright Office? I sell most of my work in the USA. Yes. Yes, you can any from anywhere in the world. You can still register in the U.S. And still take advantage of the, of uh, the statutory damages and bring the suit in the U.S. Even if people are doing it in other countries, part of the, uh, part of the international treaties. So yes, I would, I would, I would definitely do that. And okay. then you can also register in other countries as well. They don't have that same process uh, in other countries, but. Okay, uh, and Daniel uh, has a couple questions here, but I'm just going to ask one. Sure. If you photograph the scene and other people have photographed the same scene, totally independent of your original, but the exact same composition, maybe even time of day and lighting. Well, you know, it, it depends on whether, first of all, there are always, there's always going to be differences. You know, it may be very technical, 
but you can get in there and if, you know you place it on top there's going to be angle differences or whatever so you can show that it's not the same exactly the same image the question would be whether you're trying whether you knew about that first image uh in in that way and in that lighting and and the other side could show that you were trying to make a copy of that image or a derivative of that image as opposed to sort of just going and taking it yourself, like the Eiffel Tower, right? Everyone takes pictures of the Eiffel Tower. So it's really not a problem in that, in that sense. But, um, uh, you know, there was one case where, you know, someone was trying to retake Walker Evans pictures using people that looked like Walker Evans and stuff. And, and, and that was, was, was trickier, right? And in the end, it was okay for other reasons, but, um, but you know, hopefully that helps. <clears throat> Uh, any other, anything else or should I go on? Uh, you can go on. Okay. So news reporting is the next one. You know, obviously, uh, you know, we want to get information about important events out to people, but generally photography and, and, and video are not considered a, a part of that exception. So, so you do need to like, you know, license something. If, if you take a picture uh, of a, you know, a big event or a car crash or something like that. And then, you know, you load it up to Instagram and someone grabs it off Instagram and puts it on the news. That's not okay. They, they need to pay you for, for that. Um, so keep that in mind. There's a lot of citizen journalism stuff that gets taken without permission uh, by, by social, because of social media. Research and scholarship, same kind of thing. You're writing a research paper. How are you going to, you want to grab other papers to support your paper and you're doing quotes and, and sections from other papers to support it. How can you do that if you had to get permission from everybody every time you wanted to do that? So um, nonprofit educational uses. I want to show um, art in class. Um, if, the, if the educational uh, school is nonprofit, um, and it's purely for display, not for copying, let's say on paper to give out, that's okay. Um, but once you start putting it to paper, or if you're a for-profit uh, group, you're probably not gonna be in that, um, in that exception. And then the big one is really is parody. A lot of people use parody to get out of infri uh, infringement sometimes because it's, a, it's sort of a critique. You're making fun of, of something and when you're making fun of that something, um, it's, it's okay because it is like a critique. You're using humor as a way of critiquing the thing. But uh, don't get it confused with satire, which uses that thing to make fun of something else. And if you do that, satire is not covered as an exception, but parody is. And it's the way Saturday Night Live gets away with a lot of uh, using a lot of the material they use. So, um, hey, Steve. Um yeah. Good question here. Are there simple ways to track infringement? I'm thinking of okay. knitwear designers who write a pattern, sell it for three to ten dollars per pattern. Someone buys it, then copies it for their friends, so they don't have to buy it. So when it's on that kind of scale, how do you track it? Right. So I use a, a company called Image Rights to do that. Image Rights is really two functions. We are actually partnered with them, so they're they're, they're really good good software and nice people. Um, you can actually register your copyrights through them. They're one of the only groups that you can do outside of the copyright office. One of the things that the copyright office does, which is kind of ridiculous, is that uh, they don't attach the imagery to the registration. So you ever get them separated, it's a nightmare. Um, so, you know, you only have a description, not of the actual image. Uh, so you can actually register your work through image rights and they'll put it in their database and match the registrations together. But they also then take any, whether you register or not, they take the images that you upload to their system and they use their bots to scour the web and they will let you know when uh, uh, something is being used without, is being used. And then uh, you can uh, decide if that's okay and then it'll disappear or if it's not and they'll actually help you uh, if it's something that you can sue over. Um, which, you know, if there's no, let's say DMCA protections, which I'll talk about at the end, then, um, then they'll handle the lawsuit and they won't, and they won't charge you until, until the end. So I would check them out. Uh, I use them. They work pretty well. So. Thanks, Steve. Uh, it's imagerights.com. Um, so let's talk about just generalized fair use. This is, uh, this is the hardest part to figure out. People want to know when can I use someone else's stuff? Um, you know, art is a form of speech and, and 
you know, using other people's things sometime is important to make that case. Um, people uh, think of pop artists like Andy Warhol and Robert Rauschenberg and Klaus Oldenburg. Andy Warhol did his, you know, soup cans and that is, you know, would be normally considered a copyright infringement, but the way that it was put out there as, uh, you know, a mirror on the needs and desires of the American public and as an art, you know, as an expression of, of free speech and art, um, he was able to do that, right? So uh, we don't want to, we don't want to stifle artistic expression. Um, so the courts have sort of found these ways to, to, to make it work. And that's through this idea of fair use. And you can see on the left, there's two pictures. Um, uh, the, the, the left one is from a Marlboro Man ad and the right is from Richard Prince, who we'll talk about in a minute. He's an appropriation artist who's done a lot of this copyright, uh, been involved in a lot of these copyright issues. Um, and Richard Prince did this and, and it was the way that he sort of couched it as a, a critique on society and whatnot that made it uh, fair use. He didn't use the actual picture. He created another version that would have been a derivative, but he was able to get away with it. Uh, and on the bottom, you see a, a Tom Wesselman uh, oil painting that has seven up and, and some other rice krispies and things like that uh, because it's his artistic expression you need to be able to use that to make it and so it was considered fair use so when we t this is this is one of the hardest concepts to get and there's no bright line rules here um, and nothing is really fair use until the court decides so if you were to come to me with a, with an image or a book or whatever it is I, I couldn't tell you definitively whether that would be considered fair use, but I could maybe tell you, uh, you know, based on the court, what, where it would lean and what the, maybe what the percentage of risk would be, but I, but you can never say, no, that's definitively fair use. Um, and so what they look at are these four factors and they, they, they weigh them. Um, there's no one that's more important than another. And there's a lot of leeway and different courts uh, have interpreted things very differently. And so depending on which court you're going to fight in, uh, this, the, the rules may be a little bit different. But the general four factor test looks at these four things, which is how much of the thing did I use to get my point across? So uh, if you're using, you know, an entire image of somebody's, you know, to get your point across, that's a little harder than if you're just using a piece. Let's say I don't know, let's say I created a, an image that had a Mickey Mouse body and Donald Trump's face and a Burger King crown. And, you know, uh, all three of those things, the picture of, was taken by a photographer of the face of Donald Trump and the Burger King crown design is Burger King's copyright and the Mickey Mouse body is Disney's copyright. But together, you know, I've only used pieces of them to create something that, that's new. And so there'd be a good good case for it being uh, fair use, as opposed to if I created, you know, if I took an entire scene of the Disney of Mickey Mouse and just replaced his head, that would be a harder uh, sell to make. Then there's the purpose of the use. Basically, whether things are transformative, you know, are you creating a new audience for this, for this piece? Are you using so much of the original work that, um, that no one needs to to buy the other work anymore, that, that there's no new audience, it's for the same people. Um, but if you create something new, that entirely new audience is looking at, and it's a different piece, then that leans towards fair use. Um, also, the sort of the nature of the work, you know, is it, is it informational? Is it entertaining? Is it uh, for a nonprofit group? Um, or is it a totally commercial? Is it on TV as a commercial? Uh, so they'll look at that. And then, and then sort of the effect on the market, particularly if you're cannibalizing the sales of the original person, right? So if you create something and then people start buying your thing instead of buying the person who created it originally, that's not going to go over pretty well. And I always say like fine art tends to have this sort of unwritten exception. You know, people, it's one painting that's going on the wall. It's not, you know, the end of the world and they tend to let it go. But if you take that painting and, and it's got some copyrighted material in it and then you put it on pillows and you're selling a million of them at Target, now well, people, people start coming out of the woodwork in those kind of situations, both for the money and because um, of the effect it has on the market and that they would want some of that profit for themselves. Hey, Steve, what's, yep. 
what's the deal with putting the copyright symbol after your name and the date? Like if you post a picture of yours on social media, is that okay? okay. Not okay. okay yeah. So I'll talk about this a little bit more at the end, but um, it's not required. The copyright symbol hasn't been required for like you know since the 1976, I think. Um, it doesn't hurt because it, you know it, it shows that it's yours. Um, most people don't want to do it because it takes away, you know, watermarks and things like that take away from the, from the image. But as part of the DMCA, which we'll talk about later, if somebody uh, removes that, then they can be fined up to, you know, if they crop it out, they could be fined up to $25,000 for doing that. So it's not a bad idea. The, the only thing is it's kind of hard to prove that they were the ones that cropped it out. Um, they could have gotten it that way, especially the way the internet works. But it is a good negotiating tactic and something to add in if you're trying to, you know, negotiate a settlement in a lawsuit. So, um, but it's not required, you know, so you don't need it. Okay. Um, we just talked about Richard Prince before. He was the Marlboro Man guy. Um, he he does a lot of things that are <laughs> are pushing the edges of stealing people's stuff and copyright. And he knows a lot about it because of this case, Carrie V. Prince, which um, is a seminal case on fair use in the Second Circuit Court, uh, federal court. <clears throat> so on the left um, is uh, Patrick Carey used photography of, he was, did a whole book on people living in Jamaica. And uh, Prince saw the book and started doing what you see on the right. And uh, in the lower court, in the district court, when it came to, to, to a lawsuit over it, they favored uh, Richard Patrick Carreyou saying, you know, this isn't, isn't transformative enough and whatever, but in the, but in the appeals court, the, the, the federal circuit, second circuit court, um, which a lot of people now, which most courts are following, um, sort of lowered the bar and, and said that this work changed the work in such a way that it created a new work that was going to another audience and that it wasn't, it wasn't cannibalizing Carrie's book. Um, they were being sold with Gogosian Gallery to a totally new uh, group. And after like three years and, you know, lots of money in this lawsuit, uh, Prince, Prince won. And, uh, and it set the bar lower for what, what is considered transformative. So it's an important case. Not every court uh, is required to follow it. Um, the Supreme Court, er, the Supreme Court is the, you know, the the court that everyone has to follow. Um, Second Circuit means that the other circuit courts don't have to follow, but they 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 tend to. Um, so, if you're trying to figure out what's fair use, you can kind of look to a case like this and look at what they did here and say, well, you know, maybe my work is fair. You know, what, what I'm doing is fair use as well. For me, the way, the easiest way to look at it all is, is it transformative? Is it creating a totally new audience? And am I not cannibalizing the, the profits or the sales or, or, or use of the work that I, that I am appropriating? Uh, let's quickly just talk about copyright duration. How long is the copyright? It's changed a lot over the years. Um, which makes it very confusing to try to figure out what is actually copyrightable. Now, from our perspective, it doesn't matter. Duration almost doesn't matter uh, for our own work because um, it's life of the author, you know, whoever created it, plus your life, plus 70 more years. Um, for a corporation, it's 95 years from the time it was published. So we're good, you know, like you know, if I create something, I know it's, it's protected for, for quite a while. So, but, but it, when you're trying to use other people's work, it's always good to sort of know uh, or, or find work that is in what they call in the public domain. It no longer has copyright. I've been doing uh, some ads lately and I've been using some work uh, from the Bauhaus era and, and knowing that that work is uh, copyright free, I can use it to create other work. So, uh, I'm not going to read all, all this, but, but um, because it's changed over the years, there used to be, used to have to have uh, a copyright notice, the little C thing that we were just talking about. And you used to um, only have copyright for 28 years, and then you had to re-register to get another 28 years. And so 
knowing, and then, and then when they made the new laws, some of it was retroactive, some of it wasn't. And so to, to try to figure out, you know, did that original work have a copyright symbol on it? Am I looking at it now because it was cropped? You know, did they re-register? All of those kind of things is kind of difficult. So what do we know though? We do know that any work created prior to 1923 is copyright free. Um, because that's long as it can be. That's the 95 years from publication on the corporation. So you know anything before 1923 you can use. That means Van Gogh's, Monet, early Picasso, um, all of that stuff you can use with, with impunity. Um, and any work from an artist who died 70, more, 70 or more years ago, which is anybody who died before 1948, um, is generally... Uh, copyright free unless they transferred their work before they died to uh, some kind of corporation or an estate or something in a particular way. Now, nobody really knew these laws back then. And so the odds of someone having done that are probably pretty small. So you can, so every year, you know, you can look and say who died this past year and those new works come in, come into the public domain. Um, you can see the work on the left here is Lazlo Maholi Nagy, uh, work for the Bauhaus, one of my favorite artists, um, Kandinsky, people like that. He, uh, Nagy died in uh, 1946. So his work is, is, uh, is copyright free, it can be used. Um, when I send you these slides, I just put together this chart to make it a little bit easier to figure out. You know, it's, it's you know, 1923 to 1963. First, you did it have the little copyright symbol on it. If it did, did they renew? And it sort of works your way through to determine whether things are in the public domain or not in the public domain. Um, but generally, if it's after, you know, 1978, uh, you're pretty much sure that it's in copyright and, and it gets a little more dicey in the middle. Uh, last, where are we? last slide, then we can take some questions. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act. This, this is a, an act that was, uh, passed to handle uh, one, the issue of what we talked about before, the, the uh, what they call copyright management information, which is the copyright symbol being cut out. That's part of this Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, but it was originally designed to protect sites that are hosting user-generated content because that's what sort of started to happen. The internet, take you know, a YouTube or, or, or Ingenious. Somebody's uploading work, uh, a movie or um, you know, or, or artwork. And because copyright's no fault, if somebody were to upload uh, copyrighted material onto our ingenious, our ingenious would be responsible because we're showing it, we're displaying it, it's being copied onto our site, even though it was some user that did it. So um, in order to make sure that we can have our ingeniouses in YouTubes and Instagrams and all this stuff, they came up with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which uh, keep which which allows the uh, the entity like our ingenious to not be sued for user generated content, in let as long as they follow some simple rules. And if your work is being you know used, let's say on Etsy or or or, or places like that, you know it, it it helps to know this because you realize you can't sue Etsy because they are. Um, they're protected in what they call the safe harbor because they follow these rules. You can still see the, the Etsy store, but um, obviously the better deal would be to try to get to a corporation like Etsy or Genius, but we're protected as long as we follow these rules. And the first rule is to register as an agent with the US Copyright Office. <clears throat> and, the, and there's a link in here, but you can check to see if these companies are registered. What you'll find is a lot of smaller sites say that they're um, following the DMCA, but they never registered, you know, so if they didn't register, then they're not protected. The next is there needs to be a process for removing the infringing material. Sometimes you'll hear about it as a DMCA takedown. Um, that information has to be available, uh, has to be available, has to be um, easy to find on the site and easy to, to manage. And uh, if you submit a DMCA takedown, the uh, the site is required to remove the work. Um, in a, you know, in our ingenious, we automate that system. We want to make it easy. 
you, if you see a work that's infringing, there's a DMC button, you push the button, it fills everything out for you, sends it to us, it gets taken down automatically. Other places you're gonna need to fill out a form, give them your address, give them the URL or whatever it is and send it in once, uh, you know, by email or whatever, and then they get it and they have to take it down. So um, if you see your infringing material, that's how you take it down. Downside is people can go put it back up again and then they, you send another one, they take it down. You can go into this battle until it gets to the point where, you know, a, a, an organization takes, you know, take, can take the responsibility and sort of outlaw these people from coming on the site. But then they may, you know, open up another account and do it again. Um, so it, it's, it's a little bit difficult to handle in some cases, but that's what it's for. Now, if it's, there's a false positive, you know, if, 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 you, if, if you have something up and someone says you don't have the right to that nest and have it taken down and it, you do have the right to that, uh, they have to notify you that the takedown's happening and then you fill out a form and then it, it goes back up automatically until uh, there's a lawsuit over it. So, um, so someone can't just harass you and, and go take down all of your stuff. You know, if they try to do that, then you have to put it back up. So, um, yep. Uh, there were a couple of questions about design patents and can I like copyright a technique? Yeah, so um, yeah, let me t talk about patents. Um, design patents are what they call ornament ornamental patents. That means that a patent is, uh, is protection over some kind of thing that has utility, you know, that it does something and your and that function has to be unique and all of those kind of things. And then you get protection for that. Um, the design has to also, in order to be protected, has to be ornamental. It can't be part of the function. So industrial design kind of things, it's, it is, is hard to, uh, to patent because the design isn't ornamental. It's usually part of the, thing that you're creating. But if you think of something like um, the little Jaguar that's on the front of a Jaguar that sticks out or used to on the front of a Jaguar, you know, that, that little Jaguar is just a design. It doesn't matter whether it's there or it isn't there. And therefore that could be considered a design patent. Um, you know, uh, furniture design, um, you know, it, it's, a, you know it, it's a little bit in the middle. You know, if the, if the furniture if the design uh, is important to the function, then it's not really uh, design patentable. But if it's just ornamental, like it could have been any kind of design, it didn't really take away from, from, from what it was, it didn't enhance or change the thing itself, then that could be considered uh, a design patent. Design patents, not that cheap to get, um, you know, compared to patents they are probably, you know, I, I as patent attorney, charge, you know, like $2,500 or so to get a design patent. They tend to come through faster. A patent could take, you know, three to 10 years. A design patent usually come through in, you know, less than a year, year and a half. Um, but as soon as you uh, do your patent, you get that patent pending. So everybody knows that it's, it's getting ready to be patented. And the penalties for patents are, are much more severe than they are for copyright. Um, they involve a lot more things that you can attach to. Someone buys something uh, uh, that's, uh, and then buys something else. Sometimes you can attach those other things they bought, even though it's not your patent. So um, people get scared of the patent pending. So it's, you know, if you can get it, um, it's always good to, to have. And what um, about the patenting a, a technique or process? Yeah, so you can patent a process. It has to be, really has to be unique. Um, lately though, you know, process sort of processes that sort of fallen out of favor through some court cases. Software is a typical example. Software is very hard to patent now because it's purely a process unless that process is attached to some unique physical item. Um, software tends to not get patented anymore. It's like 85% of software that goes in is no longer patentable. But what if it was like a, a process or technique with pottery? You know, it's hard to say. It has to be really unique and um, you know, never been done before and not, a, not the next step in line from something else. Uh, but in pottery, it probably involves you know, certain types of machinery um, and that machinery in itself could be 
that could be somewhat unique. If the machinery is the same thing that everyone else does and just the process, it can be, it's harder. I can't say definitively patents are hard to get, you know, there's only 30% of the patents or so get, you know, finally get patented. Um, it's also hard to protect when you think about it from that point of view, how do you, you know, you, you know, what is the process and then trying to prove that someone else is using the exact same process without any, you know, sort of deviations from it. It can be difficult sometimes. Um, uh, but I'd have to, and then we have, to, you know, in order to say it, I have to go see what else is out there, um, how unique it is to, to, to but if, if someone's interested, you know, just email me and we can talk about it. I mean, it's, it's, it can be done. <coughs> I just can't really say, uh, you know, without seeing it. And, and Steve, uh, what about Etsy? Are they a passive provider? Because yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they have DMCA, their passive provider. Um, now, they're a little different than something like Cafe Press, right? If, you know, they make t-shirts and mugs and stuff like that. Um, so Etsy just sets up the store, you know, and, 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 and then it's the people that are uploading and they're just, they're not doing anything with, with the thing, right? They're just this passive provider that, that is creating the environment. Um, and that's why they get their protection. But if you look at something like Cafe Press, who also makes t-shirts and mugs and stuff like that. They're not really being passive anymore. They're sort of being active. And there's no real definitive rule about this kind of stuff yet. And primarily that's because these things get settled out of court because, you know, Cafe Press and a lot of other companies that do that kind of stuff like Smug Mug, they don't want any ruling to come down against them. So <coughs> they tend to settle and the settlements are private. Um, but in those situations, there's, you know, there's some possibility of going after, you know, a cafe press or a smug mug or something if they're and printing you, your stuff. Are there international patents and national patents? Like yes. Okay. Yes. So patents, you know, every patent has to be done in every country pretty much has their own system. Um, but there's sort of an integrate, a bit of an integrated system to make it easier. So if you were patenting something in the U.S., you send it through the U.S. Patent Office, the U.S., but you do what they call a PCT application, which is a patent cooperation treaty application. And then that gets sent out to be reviewed by the other countries through this sort of elaborate process. But when the time comes that you, that, that it's ready to be patented, um, that, 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 that it's been approved and you have to choose the countries with which uh, you want to actually patent it in and then uh, they actually have to do their own review, but they usually take the review of the of the treaty, uh, the, the the treaty information. So it's not a usually not never an issue, but it, it can cost a lot of money because you have to end up paying patent fees for every one of those countries, and patent fees can be pretty expensive, you know. Okay. And then maintenance fees and, and stuff. Uh, Steve, one last question regarding fair use. Mm -hmm. Does this apply to trademarked items like Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, or only just copyright items? Just, just copyright. So trademarks is, you know, totally different. And whether, you know, what you're, what they're trademarking, Disney, I don't know for sure, but I would imagine they trademark the ears for Mickey Mouse, not necessarily the character. Um, obviously, you know, Walt Disney's signature is probably a design mark, um, the name, obviously, Walt Disney. And, and you know, there's a whole other set of, of issues around uh, around trademarks, which maybe we'll do another talk on. Um, because there's some advantages to artists to have trademarked their names and things like that. Steve, uh, one final question. I think is, this is a good one because this is what we've been talking about. So I apply for a grant with an idea about an artwork or I have an idea for a product. Why can't I protect that? I, again, ideas are not protected. It's the execution. It's like how f you have to go farther to, you know, you can't say like, I just have this concept, you, you know, the, you have to create, you have to do, do something with that concept to show that, uh, that it is something that's real. It's basically what happens. You can't just, because otherwise everyone would just be spouting ideas and then they would create an, like, like the Harry Potter book idea. You know, I want to create a book about a wizard, you know, and then no one else could ever create a book that has a wizard going to a wizarding school because that was my idea. And so it's too amorphous in patent world. It's the same thing. You have to, you have to get to the point where that uh, you don't have to make the thing, but you have to know it can be made. 
um, in order to, to protect it. So, um, but what you can do in a situation where you're uh, talking with a company about, about doing the idea before you do it, or you have this concept and you're trying to get a company to help you or a company to help build, build it or manufacture it, then you work with uh, non-disclosure agreements. So you basically, you know, you're walking in and you're saying, before I tell you this idea, you have to sign this paper that says, you know, um, you, you can't share the idea with anybody. And if you do, then you're responsible for all the things, all the profits I lost because some other company made it or, or did something with it. Um, you know, they, they don't always work because if the idea is too much of an idea or if they already had that idea um, because it was too broad, um, the NDA may not hold, but, or even worse, a lot of these companies are not going to sign NDAs because they don't know what it is you're bringing them and they don't know, they don't want to get locked into something. So, um, but that's really the way that you would protect an idea. Okay. Um, sorry. One last one, just because yep, it's that's whatever I'm easy. What steps as individual artists need to be taken to protect the legitimacy of our visual art at creation? Do we have to register each piece and or register ourselves? Yeah, so, you know, there's not a lot you can do in today's society about, you know, protecting things in advance um, without, you know, doing, you know, you could do the basic things like don't upload, you know, super high res images. That way, at least, you know, things can't get printed. Um, you know, you can stick a watermark on your image, uh, but you know, we're visual artists. So we don't want to stick a giant watermark on this thing that you're trying to show is beautiful. It sort of takes away from the whole beauty of it. Um, so things definitely tend to be more, um, more about getting, getting justice after the fact. And if you want to make, if you want to be able to do that, yes, you need to register the works. Now you don't have to register all your works, register the ones you think people are, are going to steal certainly the ones that are the most popular are the ones that you're pushing out the most. Um, you know, if it's just haphazard stuff, then, you know, you don't necessarily need to spend the money. It can get expensive if you're, you know, if you're trying to um, register everything at $35 a pop. But, you know, there are some, I think, you know, like there's some things that are more, uh, that are worth more than others in your catalog of things that you're creating. And you might want to make sure those are registered. Steve, if you're um, a very uh, responsible and prepared artist, you're looking at your will and your legacy um, and how your work will be protected after your death, how can you transfer a copyright to a person or a trust? Um, or can well, you? Uh, you can. I'm not a trust attorney, so I'm not as familiar with the process. But yes, you can transfer all that stuff. Generally, it'll automatically go to your, um, your, your heirs. And, the, and again, it's life, it's life plus 70. So uh, whoever is the designated heir of yours will automatically get the copyright to continue for another 70 years and they'll control it. If you wanted to go into a trust, that's, that can all be done. Uh, you know, I don't know the mechanisms, um, you know, a trust attorney would know that, but it's not, uh, it's not particularly difficult. You know, it's part of the normal trust process. And what if you have an idea that you fixed in a drawing for a sculpture. You haven't made a sculpture, but you've drawn it out. Does that protect it? The, the, the drawing is protected. The sculpture is necessarily protected. Uh, it, you can make a case that the, that the drawing is, um, is the sculpture. And if someone, if someone made, let's put it this way, if someone made the sculpture, they're making it because they, copied they did it off of this drawing so there is some uh you know some protection there um obviously it's better to create the sculpture and 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 you know and and because then it's it's copyrightable or even if you make a small version of the sculpture um it doesn't matter that it got bigger for the real sculpture um but there's there's definitely protection there i mean you know you could definitely make a case certainly certainly the the drawing is protected you know um, but it's, it would be tricky. Okay. All right. Well, we got some uh, questions we didn't get to, but, um, Steve will answer them. We can create, um, a group email for everyone. And right. I wanted to thank everyone for attending. Thanks Steve for his time. I, I think we got a lot of information. So thank you, Steve. And yep. we'll see 
everyone a link to the webinar replay and I uh, hope you can join us for the next one. All right. Thank you all. Thanks everybody.